just want to thank him. And I want to give honor to the First Lady, Sister Parker. Amen. Amen. And uh, I, I want to take this time to uh, many of you. I, I know many of you, but you may not know my family. So I just want to introduce my family. I want to start with my youngest is Justice Wilson. Uh, the reason why he did not come down, because he's 13. He's a teenager. Stand up, Justice. He's 13. And then my uh, fourth son is Jared Wilson. Stand up, Jared. My second son is Joshua Wilson, Alabama A&M State University. Uh, Alabama A&M University. All right. And then the advantage, you know, the advantage of having five boys is that even when two are missing, you still got three right there. That's a big advantage. So my other two, uh, uh, John, my oldest, is at a wedding in San Diego, and my uh, third son is in Seattle in school. And I want to introduce my beautiful wife, uh, Sherry L. Wilson. Stand up, Sherry. Keeps everything together. Hey, Amen. And then I want to just... Uh, Thank Golden Gate for being such, uh, being kind to me and supportive of me and being a big encourager of me since I've been here since January. Thank you so much. And then I want to thank my friends who have come here to support me this morning. Amen. All right, all right. Let's uh, turn to the Word of God. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. Acts 17, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Amen. Acts 17, 1 through 9. All right, everybody standing. Let's go with it. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom. On three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring him out, seeking to bring them out of the crowd. And when they could no longer find them. They dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down, have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed. And when they heard these things, and when they had taken the money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. I want to just highlight uh, one verse, one verse. It is going to be, it says in verse 7, these men have turned the world upside down, have come here also. As you take your seats, I want to title the message, they turned the world right side up. They turn the world right side up. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious Father, we love you so much, Father. Thank you for being so good to us. Father, be with me as this word goes forth. Let the words that come out of my mouth be your words. Let me drop into the background and let you come into the foreground. Father, speak to us this morning. May we apply it to our lives. May this be for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I have found out that many people have adverse reaction to change. 
a lot of people do not like to have their cheese moved. They like things to remain the same. They like to keep things as they were. They don't want things to be changed. I know that when I go to a Walmart in Red Oak, I somehow think the Walmart in Cedar Hill is the same. And when I'm looking for something in Cedar Hill, I think it's the same place as it was in Red Oak. And that bothers me. It troubles me because I want it to be the same. I want the dog food to be in the same location in Red Oak as it is in Cedar Hill. Many of us have found that change is difficult on our jobs. A new president is hired. You get a new manager. You get a new supervisor. You've been there for 20 years. You're used to doing things a certain way. And that manager comes in. Next thing you know, it's a reorganization. And your cheese has been moved. Many times, you know, in church, we don't like change either. Not this church, but other churches. A new pastor comes in, a, a new staff person comes in, and they have all these new and crazy ideas. And next thing you know, the pastor or the new person starts shifting everybody around. And you're upset. It can happen in our country. Somebody comes out of the blue, don't know who they are. They have a different set of values, a different set of ethics. And they get elected into the office and next to you know your nation and your world has been changed completely. Sometimes when our cheese is moved, we are upset. We are in an uproar. We don't like change. <laughs> In this passage, we're going to meet a community of people who are about to have their world changed. Somebody's going to come in, a couple of individuals are going to come into their community and turn that community right side up. And guess what? They're not going to like it. They're going to be upset. How many people know that one or two people can make a difference in this world. Let me tell you a story how that can happen. There was a woman who was listening to the radio. And as she was listening to the radio, a radio host interrupted the program and said that there is a car on the interstate going the wrong way. She quickly thought of her husband because about that time of day, her husband's usually trying to make his way home. She picks up her cell phone to warn her husband. She gets on the phone and she says, honey, there is a car on the interstate. You need to be careful because that car is going the wrong way. The husband answers and says, honey, it's not just one car going the wrong way. It's a hundred of them. One person can make a difference. One person can change the world. One person can turn our communities, our nation, right side up. It just takes a few committed individuals. During our civil rights movement, there was a key incident in Little Rock, Arkansas. Nine black students tried to enroll in Central High School in Little Rock. They tried to do this in 1957, and they were testing a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1954 that abolished segregation in all public schools in the nation. The court had mandated that all schools were to be integrated with deliberate speed. And so these nine people 
tried to enter into school in 1957. The governor at that time, Orville Fabris of Arkansas, called in the National Guard to block these students from coming in to this high school. And it worked. But 21 days later, President Dwight Eisenhower sent troops in, and on September 25th, these nine students, known as the Little Rock Nine, were able to enter into school. For the next 12 months, those nine students went through all kinds of stuff. All kinds of trickery and threats and meanness. All kind of physical harm. And the way the story goes, not only did it affect them, but it affected their parents. Not only did it affect their parents, it affected the black community. But today, many years later, our, the Little Rock, Arkansas School District has black, brown, white, red, all colors of children attending their schools. In 1957, the people thought that these Little Rock Nine was turning the, the world upside down. But in reality, they were turning the world right side up. John Wesley, an England preacher in the 1700s said, give me 50 good men, I'll change this world. Ever since the fall of man, the world has been turned upside down. Ever since the fall of man, God has been sending courageous men and women to turn this world right side up. And what this world needs now more than anything else, they need men and women who are committed to Jesus and are committed to turning this world right side up. As we come to Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul has been traveling with his friend Silas. They are missionaries. They are church planners. And while in Philippi, they were beaten pretty bad for sharing the gospel. They were beating with, with rods. They were, uh, uh, they were beaten with hands and sticks and stuff. And they were placed in an inner cell inside of a Roman prison. And you may ask yourself, well, why? What happened to them? They were... Uh, well, what they did was there was a demon-possessed girl, and Paul cast out those many demons out of this girl, and it cost the owners a whole lot of money, and they were upset. They went and got the authorities. The authorities heard their case, and the authorities placed Paul and Silas into jail. And so while they were in jail, the story says they were praying and singing hymns. And God decided that it was time for them to be set free. So about midnight around that time, God sent an earth-shattering earthquake. That earthquake was so fierce, it broke the shackles off their feet, the shackles off their hands, and it opened up all of the prison doors. The rest of the story says that the guard that was there listening on uh, decided that it was time that he needed to kill himself. That's what he was required to do. But instead of killing himself, the Bible says he, he believed, and not only did he believe, but the rest of his family were saved. And then the story goes that Paul and Silas left Philippi, and they went to Thessalonica, a city they had over 200,000 people. And when they arrived there, the Bible says in our passage that it was Paul's custom to enter into a Jewish synagogue. He went into the synagogue where no one knew him. He went into the synagogue where he was a complete stranger. And what I have found out is that people who turn the world right side up they have courage to share the gospel. The Bible says for three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with the Jewish believers from the scriptures. 
And when they say he reasoned with him from the scriptures, what he did, he opened up the scriptures, showed the Jews in that synagogue, the Greeks in that synagogue, anybody in that synagogue, he showed them that the, the prophets spoke about that they needed a savior, what the savior had to do, that he would come live on this earth, he would die, and he would be rising, rose again on the third day, and he would pay the penalty for our sins. Then he showed them and talked to them about Jesus. He said Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy there was. Every prophecy that was in the Psalms, every prophecy by the prophets, Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled the law of Moses. This is the person that you're looking for. He told them, he proclaimed to him that Jesus is this promised Messiah, the one we crucified on the cross. I have found out that people who make a difference in this world, people who want to turn this world right side up, know what they believe and can't explain it. During those Sabbaths in the synagogue, the Bible says a good number of Jews were saved. They persuaded uh, f uh, these Jews to follow Christ and join their ministry. Not only were these Jews saved, the Bible says there were Greeks that were saved also. Not only were there Greeks saved, the Bible says that there were prominent women in the community, influential women in the community that also gave their lives to Christ. Paul had been there just a short time. But in a matter of weeks, many people had their lives turned right side up. Many people gave their lives to Christ. Rich people, poor people, men, women, known people, unknown people, all of these people gave their lives to Christ. And guess what? Because they gave their life to Christ, a church was started in Thessalonica. One thing I've learned is that people who are passionate about the gospel, people who turn this world right side up, they lead other people to Christ. But, you know, the world is not perfect because there's some people who like the world turned upside down. They like it that way. It works for them. They want everything to stay the same. Some people call them haters. Young people call them jelly, but the Bible calls them jealous people. The Bible says there were Jews that did not believe, that were not persuaded by Paul. They were jealous because of Paul's ability to attract a lot of people. They were envious because instead of people joining the synagogue, they were becoming converts to Christianity. And these Jews that were jealous and envious, they started to plot against Paul and Silas. And so what they did was they took some agitators. They took some thugs off the street. They formed a mob, and these wicked men went throughout the city going door to door looking for Paul and Silas. And they had the whole city, the Bible says, in a complete uproar. And when I was looking at this passage, I said, isn't it funny that these Jewish uh, leaders uh, that were part of the synagogue that should have known better, they were the ones who formed a mob uh, and a riot into the city, but they accused Paul and Silas of being a troublemaker. But I find out this will happen when you live in an upside-down world. I have found out that people who are bold with their witness, people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit, people who turn the world right side up, know that fierce opposition is coming their way when they share the gospel. In other words, I don't care how nice you are, how good looking you are, how much money you have, how much money you don't have, when you share the gospel, you can expect some opposition. The Bible says this mob breaks into the house of Jason and ransacked it, looking for Paul and Silas, but they're not there. So they drag Jason, a friend of Paul and Silas. They drag other believers before the city's officials, and they shout these words. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. In other words, these Paul and Silas were accused, and these believers were accused of troubling the world. 
you ever wonder why the world hates Christians? Because when you and I share the gospel, we are turning the world right side up. Uh, when you and I share the gospel, we are turning the world back to the way God intended it to be. The Jews here like the way things are. They were happy the way things are. But Silas, Paul, and Silas got into their space, moved their cheese, and now they were upset. These Jewish people hated change. They liked that lifestyle of legalism. They liked working for their salvation. They liked thinking they were good and righteous people. They liked their respected position in the synagogue. They liked being looked up to. They liked looking down on people. They liked being prideful and giving an order. They liked pretending to be somebody who they weren't. But when that gospel was, was, was given to them, was preached to them, it exposed them for who they were. It told them what they were doing was wrong. It told them that they were sinners. It told them that they needed a, self, a savior. See, what the gospel does, it liberates people. It made them independent of these Jewish leaders. The gospel offered grace. It gave the people truth about salvation and the forgiveness of sins. See, the gospel gives us a way to make peace with God, a way to reconcile with God. And this gospel message rocked their world because the gospel message was turning the world right side up. They had heard what had happened in Philippi. They had heard about the number of people who were saved. They had heard about the church that was started there, and they did not want that to happen in Thessalonica, and they were willing to go to great lengths to stop Paul and Silas. But one thing we know for sure, they, they, the Jewish leaders, they were right. Paul and Silas were causing a, a little bit of trouble, just, just a little bit because of what they were trying to do. But this is what the gospel does. The gospel is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts unbelievers, opens up their hearts, and began to change them. And these new believers, instead of bowing down to Caesar, now they're bowing down to Jesus, instead of calling Caesar Lord, now they are calling Jesus Lord. And one thing about the gospel, in order to change the world, it doesn't need weapons, doesn't need guns, doesn't need ammunition. The gospel works at the heart. And the way the, the gospel turns the world right side up is by transforming the hearts of men and women through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that these Jewish leaders and mobsters blamed Paul and Silas for all this rioting, all of this upheaval that they themselves caused. And the, and the Bible says that they said they were a threat to society and they accused Jason of hiding Paul and Silas. And they said they were accused of defying Caesar's laws, claiming that there was another king called Jesus. The Bible says when the Roman authorities heard this, it disturbed them, it bothered them because they had to do something about it. These were serious charges. Nobody can't, can go around saying that Jesus is Lord and not say that Caesar is supreme. They can't do that. It's their responsibility to make sure that the laws are followed. So they had to do something even though they had little evidence. So what they did was they made Jason and his friends responsible. They made them post a bond, a good behavior bond. They made them promise that they would escort Paul and Silas out of the town peacefully and would make sure they would never come back. But the good news is this. Before Paul and Silas left, a church was formed in Thessalonica. And Thessalonica, that community, was on its way of being turned right side up. Let me share with you a story about the power of change. Steve Jobs needed marketing help with Apple computers. 
he needed help because at that time, IBM was the top dog in computers. He looked for John Scully. He was Pepsi Cola's youngest president. John Scully led Pepsi, did such great things that it uh, succeeded Coca-Cola as the number one soft drink in America. Steve Jobs wanted John Scully so bad. He whined and dined him for months, but to no avail. Every time he would ask John Scully to come on board, John Scully would say no. And then one last meeting that he had with John Scully in an act of desperation, Steve Jobs threw out a question, of, question to him. He said, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugar water? Or do you want a chance to change the world? That question did more to John Scully than all the whining and dining. That question pierced the heart and mind of John Scully. It was unshakable for him. And because it was unshakable, John Scully, this young man, left his got it made office at Pepsi Cola, his plush office. He was set for life. He left Pepsi Cola and began working for Apple computers. What was Steve Jobs saying? He was saying, is that all you want to be known for is sugar water? What is the value of sugar water? It's a bunch of calories. It, it expands your waistline. It, it messes with your kidneys, it really doesn't do any good, doesn't really have any substance. What he was saying to John Scully is selling Pepsi Cola, how does that change the world? How does that make a difference in the lives of people? And the answer is that it does not. And he was saying to John Scully, when all is said and done, what do you want to be known for? Do you want to be known for changing the world? I just want to say Christians, believers, you and me, we have a greater opportunity than Apple computers. We have a greater opportunity than the iPad and the iPhone. We have an opportunity to turn this world right side up. And we got to be careful not to miss our opportunity and be content on selling simple sugar water. You may be saying, what does sugar water look like? In America, we are too comfortable with things that really do not matter. In America, we are comfortable, we just crave entertainment. We want things that really have no lasting value. We become experts in football. And the last thing I heard, there are no football teams in heaven. We are comfortable with basketball and baseball. We're even comfortable with celebrity gossip. None of those things are in heaven. None of those things have any internal value. Some of us are majoring in politics. We spend hours upon hours every day looking, listening to MSNBC and, and CNN. We can tell people everything was going on. I went home the other day and, and I was having a talk with my sister and I said, she's suffering from cancer a little a bit and she spends a lot of time in bed. I said, I said, KK, you can't be listening to those politics all day long. I said, all you need to do is, is late at night, listen for one hour, and you got all that you need. I told her, I said, KK, at least if you're going to listen to it, at least put God first. This is some, some, real, some Christian stuff first, and then listen to that. We have become experts in the wrong things, television and technology and automobiles. And we become, some of us, I'm, I'm sad to say, we become experts in everything but the gospel. 
and we're missing our purpose. And God has us here today because the world needs to be turned right side up. In other words, there are some people who need to be saved. Every good coach and every good employer is looking for impact players. People that can come in and make an immediate difference. But how many people know that God is looking for impact players? God is looking for people that can impact the kingdom, people that can change the world. He's looking for the courageous, people who know what they believe, people who are passionate about the gospel, people who have a bold witness. God is looking for people who can turn this world right side up. There's a familiar saying is this, that there are people who watch things happen, and there are people who make things happen, and there are people who wondered what happened. <laughs> Paul and Silas were people who made things happen. Every time Paul and Silas took a step, the earth moved, the earth shook. They had an effect. They made things happen. How many people know that the next 10, 15, 25 years is going to be harder than the last 25 years? How many people know that the world's population is the largest that has ever been, over 6 billion people? And what that means for you, there are more unsaved people today than they have ever been. How many people know that the world is not getting better, but it's getting worse? How many people know that you can make a difference in this world, in this nation, and in your community? Let me close with this illustration. Years ago, my, a couple of my sons went to St. Philip's School in South Dallas, Episcopal School in South Dallas. And I remember uh, dropping them off at school one day, and I looked on a mural that they had on a wall. And on that mural, they had a school of fish, and the school of fish was going this way, just going that way. But there was one fish that was going that way. And the caption on that mural said, dare to be different. And if we're going to make this world right side up, you and I are going to have to be different. You and I are going to have to go against the grain. You and I are going to have to face some difficult. But guess what? You and I are different. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, guess what? You and I are different because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, you and I can do things that we would never imagine. We can say the right words that we couldn't get out of our mouths. God would take our garbled message and make it work and save somebody. Let me just do one thing. Look at your neighbor and say the words after me. Today is the day I start turning the world right side up. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.